Denver police are still looking for a suspect from an overnight shooting following a Super Bowl party. And also today, police officers from all over our state will come together to remember one of their own. Also, besides problems on the field, Broncos fans told us that there were some major problems getting to and from MetLife Stadium. More on the mass transit fail. And on to Sochi, where the Winter Olympic Games are set to open by the end of this week. This is 9 News. And Denver police are looking for that suspect in that case from last night. There wasn't too much craziness going on after the Super Bowl loss, which is a good thing. No, not here. I mean, a lot of sad faces, but I think uh, yeah. for the most part, it's remained fairly calm. At yeah. 7.01, we're going to get to the day's news here in just a minute. But first, we have got to start with the weather. Our weather is changing. The weather yes. on the East Coast is changing. Yes. It's going to be brutally cold here, and it's all moving east as well. But let's check in with meteorologist Becky Ditchfield from the Weather Center, who's got all the details. Right, good morning. So, yeah, brutally cold air set definitely settling in here over the next couple of days. We're talking about single digits for highs, overnight lows dipping below zero and it lasts for a while. This isn't one of those quick hitting systems. So far this morning, mostly clear skies over Denver, gorgeous sunrise, but other spots are seeing some patchy freezing fog. That's lowered our visibility down to six miles out at DIA, five for Greeley. Look at Steamboat Springs visibility now down to one mile. We're expecting this all to lift by nine o'clock and then our new system will roll in and it's prompted the National Weather Service to issue winter storm warnings west of Vail Pass and advisories as well, along with some watches out for Burlington and Shine Wells and winter storm warnings in a part of the state that really needs the moisture down near Lamar, Springfield, and also Holly. And those go all the way into tomorrow. As far as your forecast for today, most of today looks dry. A little bit chilly out there, certainly colder than what we saw over the weekend. Eight right now in Denver. It is four Greeley, four for Fort Collins, minus three for Ray. You factor in the light wind that we have and look at that. It feels like seven below here in Denver. Eight below is what it feels like in Greeley. Ten below for Lyman. So you need a good heavy coat this morning and heading into this afternoon. Cold for lunch will be at 26 degrees with partly cloudy skies. 28 at 3. Then we'll dip to 22 at 6 p.m. with a chance for flurries out there as that new storm system starts to approach the Denver metro area. Danielle and I are going to be talking about how much snow we're expecting to see and the cold air that comes with it in just a few minutes. Right now, a couple problems on the roads. Let's check in with Amelia. Good morning. Good morning. Morning, Becky. Yes, 703 and big problems in the Denver Tech Center. Take a look here. Northbounders solid from C470, even back past Lincoln, all the way up towards the crash, which still sits northbound between 225 and the exit ramps at Hampton. The problem here is that lanes are still blocked. Backups here intense. You're down in the single digits, so C470 out to Santa Fe can be a good northbound option. Parker Road to 225 heading through Aurora will also get around it, but unfortunately, this isn't the only slowdown that we're starting to see in the Denver Tech Center. We're now starting to back up across our ramps at Bellevue, Arapahoe, as well as our direct ramps there, County Line and Dry Creek. 225 starting to slow, even the ramps from Parker Road moving on to 225 itself. Coming up in my next update, we're going to talk about the North End, including US 36 and also 25 out of Thornton and North Glen. Thanks, Amelia. New this morning, police in Moscow say a student shot and killed two people inside his high school earlier today. Happened about lunchtime. Police say the student entered the school with a gun, forced his way past a security guard. He then held fellow classmates inside a biology classroom. A teacher and police officer were killed. The gunman was eventually arrested. Back here at home, a woman could face charges today in a deadly hit and run on I-225. That happened around 9 last night. A man was killed in the crash right there on Smith Road. His name is not being released just yet. Officers say they have arrested the driver. They caught up with her at 6th and Moline about an hour after the accident, and police tell us they think alcohol was a factor here. A section of the highway was closed while police investigated. And then there's the story of the man who was shot after a Super Bowl party after he left. Nine News reporter Colleen Ferreira has more on this. Now, police are still looking for the person who did this. Exactly. Police said the suspect took off on foot immediately after the shooting happened last night, and no one really got a close look at the suspect. That's why we don't have a description of that person just yet. Denver police need witnesses to come forward to give them a better idea of who did this, and most of all, why. The victim was shot several times in the upper body. He's in critical condition right now. The shooting happened near West 14th in Calumet. Calumet was closed at West Colfax while police gathered all the evidence they needed for this case. The Kyle police are asking for the public's help. If you know anything about the suspect, call police immediately. Okay, thank you. We'll do. A fallen Jefferson County Sheriff's deputy has 
One final journey today before he is laid to rest. Sergeant Baldwin will receive a very special honor this morning. Nine News reporter Toronto Thomas joins us with this preview. Officers have already started to arrive here at the First Bank Center in preparation for the memorial service to Sergeant David Baldwin. He was killed on Sunday while patrolling Highway 93. It is an area that he expressed great concern over as an officer and would often stay late after work to patrol that area. A driver, police say, who was making an illegal pass hit Sergeant Baldwin head on, killing him. Today, we will see flags lowered to half staff at state buildings across Colorado in memory of Sergeant Baldwin. Baldwin. The memorial service, which is taking place at 10 a.m., is open to the public simply because there are so many people who want to come out and pay their respects. We will also see a funeral procession, and that procession will travel south on Wadsworth Boulevard to I-70 and I-70 West to Colfax Avenue. We do know we'll see a lot of cars out in that area and police patrol cars as they come and they pay their respects to Sergeant Baldwin, along with so many other people. They're expecting a crowd of up to 5,000 people. Sergeant David Baldwin leaves behind a wife and a son, and he was a 27-year veteran of the Jefferson County Sheriff's Office. Back to you. Taranda, thank you so much. In Washington, the first woman to chair the Federal Reserve will be sworn in today. Janet Yellen has been vice chair of the nation's central bank since 2010. Among her challenges will be timing the drawdown of the monthly purchases of bonds that the Fed's been doing for quite some time. And it's been pumping a lot of liquidity into the economy and helping boost the markets. The 67-year-old Yellen replaces Ben Bernanke, who served as Fed chairman for eight years. It's 707 now. Our focus on this Monday is shifting to the Winter Olympics, which yes. starts this Friday in Sochi. The games start actually Thursday with slope style snowboarding, women's ski moguls, and then a team figure skating event. But then the opening ceremonies are yeah. technically Friday. Just a few days away. I know. Nine News reporter Anastasia Bolton got a tour of the mountain venues where most of the competitions are going to happen in the snow. We are in Rosa Hooter. This is the Olympic Mountain Cluster. Behind me is the Olympic Village where the athletes are staying. And you can see already the flags on different balconies representing their countries. The games are just mere days away. For months, and actually for several years, there's been concern that there won't be enough snow. Last year, officials here started snow storing snow out under giant tarps in the mountains, getting ready for the games. But as you can see, snow is all around, and the views are absolutely stunning. I don't think that if we like take pictures, it wouldn't do any justice. Like You have to be here to see how amazing yeah. everything is. Officials here are prepared to certainly make snow and lower elevation where the ski jump is to make sure that there is plenty of snow when the competition starts. Hmm. Okay, it's pretty there. Blue sky just like we have here. Anastasia will be reporting with us along with Cheryl Preheim and Matt Renew throughout the games. Happy birthday to Cheryl Preheim too. She's over there yeah. celebrating her birthday and in we, Russia. And we want to remind you that we will of course be posting Olympic competition results across the networks mm -hmm. of Nine News in many different ways. So in our newscast, we'll give you a warning before results are released. You'll hear a little chime going on. On Twitter, we're going to post them right away as they happen in Sochi. Keep in mind, Sochi's 11 hours ahead of us, so a lot of those results will be posted overnight or in the morning. Now on our Facebook page and at 9news.com, you're going to have to click through to an article to see any results. Our headlines on the home page are best efforts not to give away anything. Okay. So if you want to keep it a surprise, we're going to try to help you with that. Otherwise, Twitter's the best route. Yeah, it is. Right so you can find we'll out you know. exactly what's going on. All right, they manage the payments for some of the biggest hotels in the world, and now hackers have a problem too. Seven twelve right now. A company that runs franchises for four big hotel chains may have had customers' payment data stolen by hackers. This apparently happened all around Black Friday last year. Now banks have noticed fraud among hundreds of cards that were used at Marriott hotels last year, including locations here in Denver. White Lodging is the name of the company that may have been victimized. Management's investigating. Company runs franchise hotels not only under the Marriott name but also Hilton, Sheraton, as well as Westin. AT and T. Cutting
setting its rates for family plans with big amounts of data on them. Those new rates are available right now. They apply to plans with at least 10 gigs of data shared by a couple of phones on a single account. Savings start at 10 bucks a month. Now, the change is all part of their strategy to get people to pay a little bit more overall by upgrading from a lower use plan. In some cases, families will pay less if they upgrade, but for the most part, analysts say more data means a little more revenue for AT&T. United cutting Cleveland Hopkins International as a hub. The airline announced this weekend it will make sharp cutbacks starting in April. That means most United flights through Hopkins will be eliminated. 470 people or so might lose their jobs here. United says the Cleveland hub just has not been profitable for them. In fact, in more than a decade, they say. 713 right now. Traffic is a mess this morning. Let's check in now with Amelia. What's going on out there now? Good morning. It really is. Not only across 25 as we've already seen, but now we've got new problems to the north and the west. Eastbound across 36, a crash at Pecos just fell into place, and the backups have now pressed on through past the Wadsworth Drive, and we're going to start to see our side streets get sluggish as well, coming in from spots like Sheridan. Now, the big problem to the south has been our northbound 25 crash right in the area between 225 and Hampton. We are all clear at Alameda and Monaco. And on top of that, we're seeing that area of fog actually get a little bit smaller out across our drive near the airport. Now, because of that 225 and I-25 issue, here's the northbound backup coming out of the Denver Tech Center. Northbounders, you're in the single digits from the south side of C-470. Kyle? Okay, thank you. 714 Seahawks fans poured into the streets of their city last night after their first major sports championship in more than 30 years. The last time this happened was when the Supersonics took the NBA title in 1979. There's going to be a victory parade in Seattle on Wednesday. Now, most fans behaved, but not everybody. There was a rowdy group setting a bonfire in Pioneer Square, which is near CenturyLink Field, where the Seahawks play. The first snap and safety was only the first bad moment in a night filled with them for the Broncos. Before the game, Coach Fox said that star players had to be great in the championship game like this. Few were, however, Denver's first Super Bowl appearance in 15 years ended in that embarrassing 43-8 loss. This morning, MetLife Stadium is covered in snow. Look at this. Nine News anchors Gary Shapiro and Corey Rose still in New Jersey where everybody's packing up, trying to get out of town before some flights are canceled. Good morning from Jersey City. We do have to say this morning, congrats to Seahawks fans in the national championship. But we do have to remember, even though the Broncos didn't have a great game last night, we still had a great season. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, how many teams get to the Super Bowl, right? Right. Two. Exactly. And we were one of them. <laughs> Boy, nobody saw that coming, though, if you were a Broncos fan. So it's kind of a bummer of a morning here. Uh, but uh, again, congratulations, Seattle fans. You know, back in Seattle, they were celebrating. Boy, were they. They ever. were going crazy here, too, in New York City area. But back in Seattle, you know, they burned a couple of couches. The fire department had to come out and, yep. and put that out. But Parties uh, everywhere. Well, the weather was perfect, though, for the Super Bowl. Today, though, a snowstorm is moving in, expecting to get seven inches of snow in some places, if you can believe it. But even perfect weather last night couldn't save Peyton and the Broncos. New Jersey Governor Chris Christie may have have another transportation related controversy this morning. <laughs> We're hearing that it was just such a mess yesterday. Some people waited for three hours. Trying yeah, to get we to the were stadium. getting tweets and Facebook messages from Broncos fans saying, I'm stuck here on a railroad platform, can't get out. It was the first mass transit Super Bowl. Secaucus Junction was the only station for fans to uh, get on the shuttle trains to the Meadowlands. Fans who arrived early were met with wall to wall crowds, a long wait at the ticket line, stifling heat and in, uh, in a key situation. And that was just to get to the game. Heading home, riders faced another mass exodus. Some said it took them hours before they could even leave MetLife Stadium. It's 110 back there. You can't breathe. I made your on barely move. It's Jersey. It's they could have done better. There were reports that several people collapsed while waiting to board the train, but New Jersey transit officials said that's just not true. They insisted everyone, everything went according to plan, and they had the situation under control. If anybody was in need of water, it was uh, furnished to them, but no, no, no reported medical conditions uh, forcing anybody to be transported. And you know, after the game, the announcer at the stadium asked the fans to, uh, who are coming back to New York City to wait around in the stadium for a while to try and relieve some of the congestion because right. the trains were just so packed. All in all, uh, you know, uh, what we were hearing from the fans now that went 
was the first mass transit Super Bowl was a disaster. It was a mess. So. I mean, they accounted for 14 to 15,000 people needing to use public transportation, and 27,000 ended up using it. So, quite a bit of a difference, and obviously caused for quite a bit of congestion. Absolutely. So, we're just reporting the facts. This isn't sour grapes, but you know, but it kind of is too. I know. <laughs> we probably wouldn't be talking about this Bummer. had we won. <laughs> all right. Well, we'll be back in the next hour. Lots more coming up. Back. Okay. Hey, all right. A a recent study, by the way, found that people in the city that lost the Super Bowl eat 16% more saturated fat on this day, the Monday after the game. Mm. While in the winning city, people cut back on saturated fats, cut back by 9% on the day after their team wins the title because they're too excited. So to you're looking eat. for that comfort food, I guess. But don't overeat today. Nine News psychologist Dr. Max Wachtel is joining us once again with some advice on how to deal with all this. And I, I recommend donuts. <laughs> you, I didn't see your donuts, by the way. You <laughs> didn't bring any. No. You no. actually <laughs> say there is a serious scientific name for what people are kind of going through today. There is. It doesn't sound serious, but it is. It's called corfing. Corfing. I've never heard of this. Yes. Cutting off reflected failure. It sounds like it sounds like a four-letter word. It is, I guess. Cutting but off it's reflected failure. Okay. And, and sports marketers use this. They they know what they're doing. They uh, they they use it to uh, to describe what fans do after a major loss like this. Uh, they, they get angry. They get upset. They yeah. push their team away. And you're seeing this on social media. Uh, you know, people are saying, you know, the, I'm, I'm, I'm no longer a fan. Pay Peyton Manning was overhyped. Mm -hmm. John Elway is the worst. Uh, th those fans are going to come back. Uh, that they core for a while, and then they come back stronger than ever. So if, if you thought our fans were rabid this year, just wait until next year. Yikes. Hey, looking at these pictures, these are pretty desperate. I mean, how long does it take for the sadness to go away? Honestly, a, a couple days. Yeah. Uh, you know, one, one of my uh, t Twitter psychologist friends said, the situational depression is a whole lot better than major depression. You know, people are going to feel sad. They're going to feel upset. There's not really a whole lot you have to do. Just try not to be a jerk about it for a while. <laughs> <laughs> and put it in perspective, I guess. It, exactly. You know, the, this is important. It's very upsetting. But after all, it is just a game. I know. I know. But when Gary said, well, there's always next year, I think people right now, are, that's that's a hard thing. You're just kind of like, yeah. Yeah. Well, and, and think yeah. about these fans, the, the, these Look pictures these that you're people. seeing. Uh, you know, these people paid a lot of money to get to this game. And Well, what I'm hearing from a lot of people talking about it, you know, it's one thing to lose the game, but it's another thing to lose the game in such a big way. That's, that's From the opening snap, it, it, it hurts. There was just, it felt like nothing could go right for the Broncos. And we were on such a high. There was so much hope. Everybody was dressing in orange. Everybody was just so excited last yes. week. Yeah. I, I blame <laughs> the clingy thingies personally. There you go. Blame us. <laughs> Is that your saying, fault. Max? It's, 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 oh, yes. please don't. He's blaming you. us, and he didn't bring any. Dough. Actually, I did take a <laughs> phone. Goodbye, Max. <laughs> we did take a phone call this morning. Around that. Yeah. All right, Dr. Max, watch out. Thanks All for right. joining us. All right, there were some bright spots during the game, right? Some of the commercials, not a lot of them, but some were really good. A lot of people are talking about the one called Puppy Love, which was adorable with that cute little yellow lab. We'll talk about people's favorites coming up. All right, welcome back, everybody. We are waiting on a new storm system to move into Colorado. It's going to bring in cold and snow. You can see the winter storm warnings, winter storm watches, and advisories that are out there. But the radar screen, not that impressive with just some light snow across the western slope this morning. This afternoon and this evening is when that snow will pick up, especially west of Vail Pass, where 8 to 15 inches of snow is expected around Vail, Snowmass, Aspen, Crested Butte, and down around Telluride and Silverton. Out on our eastern plains, places that really need the moisture also get Getting it, and that includes southeast Colorado, where warnings are in effect. Lamar, Springfield, and Holly expecting five to nine inches of new snow. And here's how it times out. That snow really builds in after four o'clock to those mountain areas. The system will wrap around and then push in from the southeast, covering snow here across the Front Range and into southeast Colorado. We'll see it off and on through Tuesday, and by Wednesday morning. So long as we see a few rounds move in Tuesday, two to four inches of snow could fall here in Denver. Behind all of that temperatures fall, we're in the 20s and 30s today. Danielle's in the backyard with how much colder we'll get. Ooh, big time cold. Yes, that's coming in over the next couple of days. Look where folks are waking up to in Minneapolis, two degrees, three below out towards Chicago. We're also tracking some pretty uh, snowy conditions across the eastern seaboard. This storm system bringing in some widespread heavy snow showers at times and some pretty strong rain. Too. 
too. You can see that line just shifting to the south. Now Philadelphia waking up to some snowfall. They do have a slew of winter weather watches, advisories, warnings. Everywhere that's shaded in red under that warning, including New York, New Jersey, four to eight inches possible before the storm system begins to wind down later this afternoon. High temperatures, teens and 20s to our north, mid 40s to our south, 50s across the California coastline, and Miami feeling pretty good into the low 80s. Yes, 82 today. As far as this evening goes, we're going to be chilly. Eight degrees. We're hanging on to some snowfall tonight into tomorrow with chilly temperatures on the way. Next, nine news everywhere. This is nine news. Good morning, everybody. It is Monday, February the 3rd. I'm Kyle Dyer. Take a look at this. What a difference a day makes in New Jersey. Heavy snow there this morning. This is a video from one of our crews that is waiting to take off to come back to Denver. Uh, we've heard of a lot of delays and cancellations. But looks like this one particular crew, I think it's Kyle Clark and Linda Katsaftis, hey, our producers, are uh, ready to go. It just looks miserable. And, and it's get, supposed to pick up throughout the day. Uh, yeah, it's not slowing down. Because Gary sure. and Corey and Susie, I think, have a flight uh, at 2. 2 o'clock Eastern time, so about noon our time. 8 inches total accumulation and, and, some, and ice. some ice. And get ready for more snow moving in here right. tonight. A really cold week, too. Mm -hmm. uh, look at our high right now, what, uh, of 8 degrees? And Danielle, you say that might be the high t tomorrow or the next day? Yeah, by Wednesday. That's Yikes. a good bet. I know. And our overnight lows are going to be well below zero. So it is time to bundle it up. Winter not done across Colorado as evidence with this shot out toward Vail Eagle's Nest. Just doesn't it look freezing looking at that? Have some ice schools out there on the camera lens too. Down here in the city, Fort Collins, some sunshine. Looks really nice out there, but it feels a whole lot cooler. We are going to be sitting at about three degrees. That's what it feels like when you walk out your door. Eight below in Greeley, seven below out of DIA. So it's going to be a chilly one, but it only gets chillier. Not only are we talking about cold, but a little bit of snowfall. That's continuing to come down across the western slope. That storm system will really pick up as we go throughout the afternoon, evening, and then into tomorrow as well. But we're looking at plenty of advisories out there, winter weather watches, warnings, you name it. We're seeing some pretty good amounts down toward the southeastern corner, about five to nine inches, and then for the mountains, could tack on up to about a foot, pretty possible for our central and southern mountains. So today, a cool one, mostly dry till we get toward the evening when those flurries arrive. Becky and I will be tracking that, plus how much snowfall you could see here in the city. And we are also looking ahead to that extended day chilly forecast. In the meantime, Amelia, today's the day you probably want to crank on the heater in the car. You want to crank on the heater, absolutely. You're going to need it. You're going to need those seat heaters. Cold out there. You're going to be in your car for a bit if you're in a couple different locations. And one of those will be northbound 25 Tech Center into downtown. We've got a major accident near the 225 exit and as well as Hampton. Sun glare in the picture, but here's your northbound slowdown. Single digits and a very frustrating drive. E470, maybe park. Road to 225 or C 470 to Santa Fe, about your easiest alternates. There is so much happening out here this morning. Not only our crash down to the south side there across northbound 25, but also two right lanes are blocked eastbound 36 near Pecos. Head over towards Wadsworth, maybe connect with I 76 as well as I 70 to avoid those backups. Greg. Amelia, thank you so much. It's 732 right now, and Governor Hickenlooper has ordered all flags on public buildings to be lowered to half staff today. This is in memory of Jefferson County Sheriff Sergeant David Baldwin. Law enforcement officers from all across the state will be gathering to remember him today. Night News reporter Taronda Thomas joins us from First Bank Center in Broomfield with more on what's planned. We have already seen some of those officers arrive here at First Bank Center. And as a matter of fact, I've seen one circling around with a dog securing the area because they're expecting a lot of people here today, up to 5,000 people, all to pay their respect to Sergeant David Baldwin. Sergeant Baldwin was killed in the line of duty on Sunday as he patrolled Highway 93. That is a highway that he actually talked to us at 9 News about, expressing his concern for safety of drivers there, saying that highway needed so many more safety measures. He, in fact, even worked on his own time after work to patrol that area and make sure it was safe. Well, while driving there and patrolling that area on Sunday, he was hit by another driver. Police say that person was making an illegal pass when he hit Sergeant Baldwin head on. Sergeant Baldwin leaves behind a wife and a son and so many officers who respected and admired him, saying he always had a smile on his face and he always spoke positively about everything and loved his job with the Jefferson County Sheriff's Office. We're expecting to see a lot 
lot of those deputies with the Jefferson County Sheriff's Office here today, as well as many extended family members and friends and police officers from jurisdictions across Colorado. If you are in this area, you should know that there will be a very large motorcade in the areas of I-70, Wadsworth, and Colfax because so many people, thousands of them, will be a part of this memorial service open to the public today at 10 a.m. at First Bank Center. Kyle? Okay, Toronto, thank you. It is 734 right now, and this is going to be a busy week at the Colorado Legislature as lawmakers prepare to debate some of the bigger issues. And one of them is a bill that would repeal last year's expansion of background checks to private and online gun sales. That is up for debate in the Senate committee. Here's 9 News reporter Colleen Ferreira. She's got a full list of what's going on this week. Good morning, Kyle. Yep, on today's agenda, they're going to review a bill that you just mentioned that would repeal last year's expansion of background checks for gun sales and they'll look at a bill to toss out the five-year window in place right now to pass a school tax. Then let's move to Tuesday. Lawmakers will look at a bill that would require physicians to inform the Department of Revenue when a patient is diagnosed with a medical condition that may make driving dangerous for them and also those around them. The department would then cancel the driver's license of that person and with a medical condition, and uh, they also will have a chance to appeal that cancellation. There are severe fines if a physician does not follow those guidelines. Moving to Thursday, they'll consider a bill that prohibits the use of artificial tanning devices by minors under 18 years old. Now, unless it's prescribed by a physician, owners and operators of artificial tanning devices could face penalties if they don't comply with those requirements. And then also on Thursday, a bill will go before the House Judiciary Committee that will further define recreational marijuana sales laws. Now, the bill will make it, make it a crime to sell pot to people under the age of 21. It also gives stores the right to take away fake IDs and detain a person for questioning. Finally, on Thursday, a House committee will consider a bill that would make parolees subject to immediate warrantless arrest if they tamper with their electronic monitoring devices. That proposal was prompted by the murder of DOC Executive Director Tom Clements, allegedly killed by a former inmate who slipped out of his ankle monitor. Greg? Colleen, thanks so much. Love it or hate it, the new state logo unveiled by the governor's administration last year is up for debate tomorrow. A House committee will start talking about a bill that would let voters decide if this logo should stay or if it should go. Work on rebuilding the Royal Gorge Bridge and Parks gets going this week. The park, as you know, was heavily damaged by the wildfire last summer. It lost 48 of its 52 buildings. So the first thing to be rebuilt is a new 14,000 square foot visitor center. It should be really nice. And also planning to open up in August as well, a zip line across the gorge and also an aerial gondola. The woman known as Octomom is expected in court today. Nadia Suleiman became famous back in 09 when she gave birth to octuplets. She's now being charged with welfare fraud, accused of failing to report about $30,000 in income when she applied for public assistance. She says she's not guilty. If convicted, though, she could face at least five years in prison. Mm. Wow. Okay, this morning there's an investigation continuing into what led to the death of actor Philip Seymour Hoffman. Early reports seem to indicate that he died from a drug overdose. A friend found the Oscar winner's body inside an apartment in New York yesterday morning. It appears a heroin overdose is the blame. The 46-year-old actor won an Academy Award for the movie Capote and had three other acting nominations, including one for his role in The Master. Hoffman also earned three Tony nominations. He was a stage actor as well. He has left behind three children and a partner of many years. That's what's so sad. He apparently was on his way to pick up his kids or was supposed to, and that's when they uh, realized, realized something, something was wrong. Yeah. Edward Snowden's story is going to hit shelves in bookstores this week over in the UK. It's called The Snowden Files, the inside story of the world's most wanted man. It's set to come out here in the U.S. next Tuesday. The book is written by reporter Luke Harding from the British newspaper The Guardian. Snowden, of course, still hanging out mm -hmm. in Russia. Mm -hmm. Okay, the laughs were few and far between. Why did so many Super Bowl advertisers decide to play it safe yesterday? See Red, Think Sports. Drew Soisher on 9 News. Well, you only need the light when it's burning low. 
This was the number one Super Bowl commercial according to USA Today's ad meter. Anheuser-Busch Puppy Love was about a puppy who thinks he's a Clydesdale. More than 6,200 Super Bowl watchers were polled by our partners at USA Today to get these results. It was a good one, that's for sure. Laura Petreca is New York Deputy Bureau Chief for USA Today, and Laura's joining us live via satellite. Good morning to you. You know, if there was an overall theme, I guess, to this year's ads, it seemed to be play it safe. Talk more about that. Definitely play it safe this year. You had a lot of markers that, that didn't do very edgy advertising. They didn't show a lot of skin. And a main reason for that is because so many of these commercials are passed around on social media. So they don't want to do anything too controversial that people will pass along and critique and say, hey, this ad is terrible. I don't know how I feel about this product or this company. They decided to just take a step back and play it safe this year. Interesting. We talked about the puppy love ad, as you just heard. Let's look at what ranked right below it. Doritos had a hit with a couple of actually consumer-generated oh, spots, one of them showing a kid as a cowboy. What made this work? Guess you don't want Doritos. This worked really well because it tied in with the game's theme of competition. Of course, in this ad, you've got two brothers who are competing for a bag of Doritos. Also, what made this ad really stand out is the ending of it. The younger brother gets one over on his older brother, which lots of people like. People like the underdog to win. <laughs> yeah, you're right. And brothers, you never can go wrong with a little brother competition. Nostalgia played a big part, too. My, one of yeah. my favorites in this category, Radio Shack, they featured celebrities from the 80s. It was kind of fun to reminisce. Talk about the panel's reaction to that one. The panel loved the Radio Shack yeah, ad. In fact, it ranked fifth on our panel. I think a big reason for this is it showed lots of iconic 80s figures. Hulk Hogan, the California Raisin, Mary Lou Rutten. And also, Radio Shack wasn't afraid of making fun of itself. It was almost poking fun of itself, or <laughs> did poke fun at itself, which was great. And that's what gives you a laugh as well. <laughs> it was very successful. I was trying to count up all the things I remembered, and I think I got most of them. Lots of buzz about Jerry Seinfeld reuniting with Jason Alexander. This was a spot for Seinfeld's new web series. Did that one work? That one just did okay. In terms of that ad, well, I was monitoring that on social media. Lots of people were buzzing about it when it went on, but there had been a leak that this was going to be on, so the surprise factor diminished a little bit. And Tim Tebow, he got a lot of buzz about his spots for T-Mobile. We were expecting these. They were pretty funny, actually. He was poking fun at himself a little bit. They were fun, exactly like the Radio Shack ad. Tim Tebow wasn't afraid of poking fun of himself and the fact that he doesn't have a contract. You can see in those ads that he had a great time filming them, that he's enjoying himself. Those ads actually got passed around on social media a lot as well and they're just funny for football fans and non-football fans alike. I love the I love the Sasquatch thing but you know one thing I found pretty interesting is that a lot of these ads were really long. I, I know Chrysler had one that was two minutes long. We had some car commercials 90 seconds long. I don't think I remember them being that long in the past. I think this is going to be the future of Super Bowl advertising. So back in the day, you think about 10 years ago, even longer, lots of marketers took out 30-second ads. They had some slapstick humor, a surprise ending, and then they moved on. But now people want their ads passed around on social media. They want a story to tell. It's not just about getting the quick laugh. It's also about telling a story that people can say, oh, I can relate to that. Oh, yeah. I think that's funny. So that's what's making these ads much longer. And in the end, it may be the commercials that we remember the most. Except the play for the Broncos. I, I think from last <laughs> night's game, probably most likely. Yeah. Well, we won't go into the play of the Broncos, but thank you so much for joining us. Uh, it was uh, taking a look at USA Today's Great, ad, thank you. ad meter. You know what I'll remember from that Seinfeld commercial? Of course, Newman would be a Seahawks Newman, fan. Yes. Remember? Yeah, that was the problem, don't you think? Yeah. A bad sign. Let's get a look at the morning traffic right now. Speaking of bad signs, lots of red on those traffic maps this morning, Amelia. Yeah, boy, we're trying to work around these ongoing delays. It is frustrating to get to work this morning. We're focusing in on a couple of key spots, including that northbound 25 stretch out of the DTC. But hey, a little bit of good news. Finally, in our morning, that northbound 25 crash is clear between 225 and Hampton, so we should see a little bit of improvement. But we still have that new crash northbound 25 near Santa Fe. Across our side streets, Alameda and Monaco is now clear and across your drive times. We still do have some pretty big backups here. 22 minutes across 225 coming in from 70 down towards the Denver Tech Center. But northbounders there, 11 minutes. Speed still in the upper 60s. So we'll take it upper 50s, lower 60s as you make your way past Parker Road approaching Mississippi. Becky? All right, good morning, Amelia. A lot of sunshine out there. Make sure you grab your sunglasses, but you need a heavy coat. It is only nine degrees outside Nine News, and we're going to be warming up a little. Today, actually, the warmest day we have over the next four.
25. 17 Westminster for you at 8.30, warming up to 30 degrees by 12.30 this afternoon. Coming up, highs in the single digits. Kyle and Greg, Danielle and I will have that forecast for you in a few. Right, Becky, so did you see Seth Meyers has made his last appearance on the Anchor Desk as co-host of Saturday Night Live's Weekend Update. He's been with the show for 13 years now. He was given a nice warm send-off by some of his friends, as you can see, including uh, former co-host Amy uh, Poehler and also Bill uh, Hader was there in character as Stefan and Andy Samberg. Myers will take over Jimmy Fallon's spot on late night. That will start, uh, I think, February 24th after the Olympics. Fallon's moving on to uh, Jay Leno's spot on The Tonight Show. If you yeah. haven't been watching those promos yet. And then this Saturday night, they reran his special, which was so good. It was, I oh, wish I didn't it, see it. it was yeah. a rerun of it. And so it kind of, I think, will get people excited who haven't been staying up that late right. to watch him when he comes on earlier hour. All right, he once caddied during the Masters, and now he can tee it up with the best of the mas that Masters has to offer. We have made our way out of the single digits now, up to 10 degrees outside Nine News. We've got a lot of sunshine. That's up across the Front Range. Up in the high country, a little bit of a different story. This is Steamboat Resort actually seeing some fog out there this morning with one mile of visibility. We have six out at DIA, two for Greeley. So we have some patchy freezing fog here across the Front Range that will be lifting by 9 a.m. Now, this is all ahead of a new storm system that has already prompted the National Weather Service to issue winter storm warnings and advisories for mountain areas west of El Pass. Watches and warnings for eastern and southeast Colorado. Colorado. It's not all that impressive on radar right now. Some light snow is coming down in the high country, more so along the western slope, but that will be getting worse through the day. Winter storm warnings cover our central mountains where places like Vail, Snowmass, Aspen, and Crested Butte will see 8 to 15 inches of new snow. Same goes for Silverton, Telluride, and Uray. And then out on our eastern plains, Burlington and Cheyenne Wells under a watch where 4 to 6 inches of snow could fall. 5 to 9 expected in southeast Colorado, Lamar, Springfield, and Holly. A place where we really have very dry conditions, so that moisture is going to be much needed and welcome down there, so long as we don't see too much wind. Now, it all gets going after 4 30 this afternoon, starts to build into the high country. 10 o'clock tonight, we'll see some moderate snow out just to the west and south of the Denver metro area, and then we're going to see some heavier snow build into southeast Colorado, move on to the front range through early tomorrow morning. A few rounds expected to move in Tuesday afternoon. So by early Wednesday morning, we could get anywhere between two and four inches of snow from Fort Collins down through Castle Rock and out into our eastern plains. A little bit more closer to eight around Idaho Springs, about five for Evergreen. So we're expecting anywhere between four and eight inches up through parts of our foothill, especially those southern foothill locations. The other part of the storm system is the cold. Today's going to wind up being one of the warmer days we have this week. High of 30 for Denver, 24 Greeley, 26 in Fort Collins. Danielle, you're watching other locations across the rest of the country, but all that colder that's building into. Yes, absolutely. You know what? A little bit of snowfall on the way to Colorado. We're tracking a lot of it across the eastern seaboard. Look at that. Plenty of rain as well as snow, and you can see that dividing line just near about Philadelphia. They've been uh, looking at earlier this morning some rain showers, and now finally temperatures are getting so, so cold that they're tracking some snowfall. See those dark blue bands traveling in over Philadelphia, stretching all the way up to New York? Some really heavy Heavy snowfall is coming down up there anywhere between four to eight inches of snowfall as this storm system quickly zips on by. And you know what? It should be done for by late this afternoon. That's when all the warnings, the watches, they all expire later tonight. And everywhere in red that you see, that's where we could tack on anywhere between four to eight. Better bets on the higher end of that. Now, as far as our temperatures go today, like Becky was saying, it's feeling pretty good. Only in the teens as well as 20s for daytime highs, but that looks good in comparison to what the rest of the work week is going to look like. At 2 o'clock, not too bad today. And then we see that big pool of cold air sink down closer to Colorado. This is at 10 a.m. on Thursday. We'll just be at zero, where our neighbors to the north even chillier. It's not till this weekend that we start to finally moderate with those numbers back to the teens and 20s. So tonight, we're down to 8 degrees, still hanging on to the cloud cover as well as the chilly temperature. Snow getting going overnight, continuing for much of our two Tuesday. And look at this. Daytime highs 14 for tomorrow, 7 by Wednesday. It's just going to be frigid out there. Overnight lows the next several evenings will be well below zero. Finally, by Friday and into next Saturday, decent chance for seeing some snow showers, and that will actually help us out, warming us. Wow, to a balmy 21 by Saturday. Kyle. All right, thank you. 754.
Uh, that's what we have to talk about now. The Broncos players' faces said it all at the end of the 43-8 to blowout as they made their way to the locker room. It was a game filled with all sorts of bad moments and miscues. The loss was tough on everyone, including Champ Bailey, who had waited 15 seasons to get to a Super Bowl. You know, it, it's two points. I mean, you can bounce back from things like that. And unfortunately, they went down, kicked the field goal. You know, and then, you know, things just kind of got out of hand after that. You know, you, you can't play a good team like that and make mistakes. And they're going to make you pay. You can't give a team like that drives. And, and what, what, hap what tends to happen is they keep, continue to run the ball, play action, making plays. You give them more opportunities, I mean, they're going to make you pay. That's, that's pretty much how this league works, and especially against good teams. Peyton Manning said, yes, the loss is disappointing, and it's not an easy pill to swallow today. Broncos executive VP John Elway called it just one of those nights, noting the Broncos had a tremendous year. He said the team will learn from the loss and go at it again next year. Here's a little something to take some of the sting away. Colorado born and raised oh, yeah. Kevin Stadler is finally a so winner Kevin on the PGA Stadler Tour. He claimed his first title at the Phoenix the Open yesterday after posting a three under 68 in the final round. Stadler, a forever Broncos fan, played the final round in his orange there. Kevin wins caddied for his dad, Craig, in the Masters. And now he can team it up with him, tee it up with him. We have much more coming up in just a few minutes on 9 News 8 AM. Stay with us. High news traffic brought to you by Columbia College. To learn more, visit goforgreater.org. Columbia College, go for greater. We're so excited to be covering the Olympics with a native Russian I've been practicing. Not quite. How do you say friendship in Russian? How about we start with something a little bit more useful? Anastasia, помоги. Я потеряла своего переводчика. Anastasia, help. I lost my translator again. So, did I say it right? We'll work on it. Nine News, Vizdia. Beginning the first week of February. Hey!